Hi, everybody. Good morning uh, from Rye, New York. Uh, Danny Cherry here with you as uh, always. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, I have here uh, uh, Dr. William Levine and uh, Shmuley Kass, both uh, from Israel. Where, where are you located? Hi, Danny. We, uh, I'm, from, I'm sitting in Jerusalem right now. Um, after a nice snowy day for a change. Yeah. So I've heard. Shmulek is, I think, in Nesciona. Aha. Uh -huh. So you don't have uh, snow yet, Shmulek, but, uh, <laughs> no. but, will it, but uh, Billy, I heard you guys have snow. I mean, we, we have here in New York, and uh, wow, very nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, great. So I'm, I'm having, uh, uh, we're having a, an exciting discussion about uh, um, uh, cancer and improving the life of uh, um, of patients. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, I will start by uh, a couple of words about uh, uh, Dr. Levine, and afterwards uh, you will uh, present yourselves. Uh, Dr. Levine is the founder and chief scientist officer of um, Izun Pharma and a well-known serial entrepreneur in the pharma healthcare system. Bill has founded multiple companies in areas ranging from uh, oncology support, oral care, wound care, and cannabis, where he was awarded the Distinguished Innovator of the Year Award. Izun Pharma and Dr. Levine are currently focused on the oncology support area to improve the quality of life of those suffering from the uh, debilitating side effects of cancer therapy. He is a graduate of Columbia University School of Dental and Oral S Surgery, and is a diplomat of the American Board of uh, Periodontology. Dr. Levine is the author of multiple scientific papers and the inventor of over a hundred patents. Wow. So, um, uh, so uh, good morning. First of all, maybe before we'll hear about you, how are you guys dealing with COVID? Israel is, is pretty, in a pretty good place, huh? Here in the States, it's very slow and you guys I hear uh, even 18 year olds are done with the second vaccination. So we're actually proud to say that uh, most of our company and most of our friends and families are actually vaccinated by now. Israel has really been the world leader in vaccinations, which was a great accomplishment. Um, we're also the world leader in lockdowns, which is an interesting phenomenon as well. Uh, it wasn't an easy year, but for us in terms of lockdowns and people who couldn't make it to the laboratory and, and slow down on clinical trials that we managed simply because we were concerned that patients would not be able to arrive at the clinical trial location at the designated time. But overall, through uh, careful management of the assets and careful management of the problems, I think we came through with flying colors. So. so. We're, we're proud of the company and, 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 and happy to be here. Shmulek, do you wanna add anything? No. <clears throat> uh, so maybe uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself beyond the bio I was reading uh, and, and share with us your stories. So I actually was born and bred in New York um, and uh, studied periodontal disease in uh, uh, Columbia University and specialized, upon which I then emigrated to Israel. I set up a uh, medical practice as ca uh, peri specializing in periodontal disease, as well as an academic appointment in Hebrew University. And uh, basically, after a period of time, I began to recognize that there were serious gaps that were not addressed in managing the disease that I was dealing with and living with. And so I uh, basically morphed into a uh, drug development person. <laughs> so. and, and over a hundred patents, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, when I look back, it's incredible. Each one of them was uh, blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are also lucky, Danny, to, uh, or all the original invitation was supposed to be uh, focused on, on my background, but uh, we we're lucky to be, uh, uh, have Shmuel Kess, Dr. Shmuel Kess, join us on the call. So Shmuel, maybe just give a little background and explain to what you're doing here, and then we'll, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll continue with the uh, focus. Okay, so you started from childhood, so maybe I'll start from there, and then we'll 
well, in that one hour of my personal story. Um, but in, in general, I was, I was born in New Jersey, in Lakewood, New Jersey, from all places. Um, immigrated as a child with my parents to Israel. I'm a Hebrew U graduate. I spent a few years in Boston and Harvard MIT, came back to Israel. And since then, I've been, for the last 20 years, been involved in the biotech ecosystem in Israel as a scientist up until an entrepreneur and C-level uh, positions in various companies, private and public, and currently with Izun trying to go to the next stage. Great. So may maybe we should start with uh, explaining uh, the name of the company, Izun. Uh, those of you who speak Hebrew know what it means, but we would love to hear uh, why you chose that interesting name uh, for your firm. So uh, yes, indeed, Izun means balance in Hebrew, as you know. And um, our goal when we set up the company was really to be able to balance having strong, efficacious therapeutic drugs with a healthy and uh, robust safety profile so we can give solutions that don't generate significant side effects. I'm proud to say we've accomplished that. And, 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 and I want to ask, how did you come to, to uh, develop uh, um, an impressive line of uh, oncology related drug candidates. Where did you develop the skill set and acquire that knowledge coming from where you came from, from your specific background? So it's like a story of, uh, you know, so a funny thing happened on the way to the uh, forum. Basically, periodontal disease is a relatively complex disease. It involves inflammation, it involves infection, tissue destruction, and it affects actually about 50% of the adult population, both in the US and globally. And um, I recognized the fact that there were insufficient solutions with associated side effects, and we were not really addressing the core problem of the uh, cause of periodontal disease. And so we began an altruistic research and development group with different pharmacologists, different medical doctors, myself and, and, and others looking for that solution. And we, uh, I'm proud to say we actually found breakthrough solutions for the, uh, for this, for the target of periodontal disease, which we're launching now. But, but at the same time, my expertise in inflammation and oral ulceration really allowed us to look at a bigger indication in a sense or a more life in impacting indication of oncology support. So the skill sets that I learned in developing drugs and solutions for periodontal care really morphed into becoming an oncology support company. Thank you. Um, oncology support, can you elaborate on that? What does it actually mean and how it helps the treatment of cancer and the cancer patients? So oncology support is really a, a growing and incredibly critical area. We all have friends, family, colleagues at work who have been diagnosed with cancer and who have gone through uh, current or, or are currently going through cancer therapy. And they're all suffering from terrible side effects of a disease that they need to treat in order to continue to live. So whether it's the serious ulcerations that you have in the mouth, which you know, make it difficult for you to eat and drink, associated pain, nausea, and many other symptoms which really reduce the quality of your, of your life, but at the same time actually reduce your uh, ability to get the full dose of cancer therapy. So oncology support really is designed to improve your overall health, prevent these side effects from taking place, and thereby enabling more effective cancer therapy. And uh, at the same time, you know, our world has, uh, I think, improved and grown in a lot of ways, and medicine in general has become much more patient-centric. Patient We're concerned about the patient themselves, so the patient's quality of life becomes a very critical aspect of our care, and it impacts on the way physicians make decisions and which drugs they'll prescribe. So not only are we enabling better and more effective cancer solutions by keeping our patients healthy, but we're also improving the quality of life while we're, while we're doing that. So 
those two things I think are really what's critical and what drives oncology support. And because of that, it's actually, it also is unique in the, in the oncology area in the sense that it's a platform because it crosses all, all cancer therapy. In other words, almost all cancer therapy has some form of a side effect or another. So being in the oncology support area gives us a broad range of approaches and a broad range of applications for different technologies. So it's exciting, it's very rewarding, and we're, 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 we're proud of the drugs that we're developing. Um, your leading product, and if you can also uh, describe, you know, in, in, where are you with that product? Is it already, uh, 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 in which phase are you uh, with that? Your leading product is, um, uh, Oral mucositis. Can you elaborate on oral mucositis? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's not my my specialty. That's uh, okay. The, I was once. We tend, the, we tend, the medical world tends to make these words difficult. Words difficult so that we can make ourselves feel more important. I know. <laughs> so. I know. I know. It's like the mailman in in in, uh, in Seinfeld. They told them that the zip code is just an. Inv it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's just something. <laughs> but. Uh, I was. I can tell you. I was. Just, I was once talking about. Um, I was doing a session about how companies should approach the family office space from the stem cell world. I was speaking at a stem cell summit. I was the only guy who didn't know what any panel was talking about. So, uh, so it's not new to me to not know what I'm talking about when it comes to your area. But I'm kidding. Uh, so anyway, can you elaborate on the problem uh, this product solves and why is it so important? Sure. So oral mucositis is something that we're actually all familiar with from, our, from these patients who are getting therapy uh, for cancer. It's the oral ulcerations and inflammation and dryness and pain that develop in the oral cavity as a result of different cancer therapeutic drugs. So um, pretty much 35 to 50% of all chemotherapy will generate some, a very significant oral mucositis. And uh, what happens when you have that is you actually, it's, it's very, very difficult for you to uh, eat dr and drink. Uh, aside from the associated pain and, and that, that you're, that you're experience, experiencing. So these patients then need additional care for alternative feeding methods, whether it's a PEG or whether it's an intranasal tube or whatever it is, they, they, they need some uh, support systems. And those support systems mean increased infections and increased hospitalizations. And so oral mucositis is a very critical need. In fact, it's one of the leading causes of why a physician will downregulate or change the dose of the chemotherapeutic regimen that he wants to put that patient on to allow the patient to thrive slightly better. And so he'll actually reduce what he's trying to cure. So he'll give a lower dose of cancer therapy, and then there's the chances of success obviously are reduced. Our goal really is to prevent that onset. Our, we actually designed this product to be given at the first day of chemotherapy so that we never allow the, the oral mucositis to develop, and that person can sail through his drug treatment regimen uh, without any you know, side effects, hopefully, or at least with minimal side effects. Uh, our early data actually shows very promising results. And um, uh, so basically what I asked before is, is really where you guys are with all of that. So, so what has Izun accomplished to date in developing a, a, a prevention treatment for oral uh, mucositis? Mucositis. <laughs> you just say oral, mucitis. I'll fill mucitis. in the rest. Okay, mucositis, <laughs> I'm gonna write it here. Um, so we've completed actually our trials, except for the final phase three trial. We are, you know, as we've gone through the and completed the phase two trial with uh, with good success, and we're right now we're actually discussing with the FDA and designing with the FDA the roadmap for how do we take this product through the phase three trial and to a successful drug approval. Um, we're actually expecting to get a response from the FDA back with back and forth. They've been deliberating on a number of things now, um, sometime in March this year. So it's really, uh, it's around the corner. And we anticipate starting our phase three sometime in 2021. But uh, you know, the, the, the uh, light at the end of the tunnel of the drug development is there. We know exactly where we're going, what we need to accomplish. And what's exciting about this is there are no drugs that actually have uh, 
uh, it had ever been approved for oral mucositis. So being able to break Why through a glass ceiling like that. What's that? Why is that? No drugs it's were... It's very hard. We're, 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 we're attacking the body in trying to cure that cancer with some very strong drugs. And it's, um, it's hard to prevent that. So we... Um, we, we, our phase two data showed very good results and we don't have any reason to anticipate that wouldn't carry through in our phase three, but we're very excited about not only the success, but also the benefits that it's gonna bring to people. But such a, you know, a common horrible disease, uh, the big guys, the big pharmaceutical companies, nobody tried to address that uh, issue? No, there's been some attempts that there's been some drugs that they have attempted to they have not done well necessarily in clinical trials and a lot of people have aborted those plans but i think also um the you know again sometimes you try to treat some of these problems with methods that cause additional problems one of our goals and we go back to our name izon was to balance the effective therapeutic with a healthy safety profile so um, there are a lot of these drugs that are being given IV. That's not what the patient needs, another di daily IV in addition to the chemotherapy that he's already getting. We actually designed this product to be a very simple to use at home product. We're clearly monitored by the physicians, but it's a simple oral rinse five times a day, which is not a problem for these patients because they're really um, desperate for a solution. And um, it brings pain relief and it brings uh, and it prevents the mucositis. So it's it's really an exciting uh, it's an exciting possibility here. And by the way, uh, I, will, I will go back to our questions. But who will be paying for this at the end of the day? Do you think this will be under insurance that uh, people will be getting? Do you think uh, uh, I mean who who will be the end payer for all, for this kind of drug? It's it's a very sophisticated question, and we've already done the early foundational work looking at this. Uh, it's actually something that um, because of the life-threatening problems that develop when you do develop mucositis, the insurance agencies are, ve are very interested in paying for its care and at a premium for the simple reason that every episode of oral mucositis, and there may be multiple through a course of therapy, will cost the healthcare system someplace around $20,000 per episode which is significantly higher than simply preventing these problems. So uh, from a reimbursement standpoint, we're actually positioned very well. Thank you. Um, so you, you, you chosen a fascinating um, uh, approach to uh, uh, new drug candidates, <coughs> identifying drug candidates from natural sources. What are the benefits of this approach and what are the challenges? Um, it's an interesting question, and it's a, it's a philosophical question that we often address internally in, in the company. Look, botanical drugs have been uh, a historical player in drug development. In fact, 30 to 50 percent of the drugs that we commonly use today have their origins in the natural product world and the molecules that are found in nature. And we're all familiar with some of them, aspirin, codeine, morphine, digitalis, and a, a whole range of other products are directly designed out of molecules that were found to be efficacious from the botanical world. We have a major advantage in botanicals and in meeting our, our balanced needs of therapy and safety because we can pick out compounds that we find from nature based on an enormous amount of ethnobotanical data on, across many different cultures. So for example, if people are using a certain plant to, to treat a certain disease, we, and, and they seem to be getting a, a strong effect. Well, we then will look at that plant, understand which molecules are effective, understand methods of pulling those specific molecules out and optimizing them to get even a, a more predictable and a more profound therapeutic benefit. But at the same time, we have the benefit of knowing that this drug is safe based on that ethnobotanical data. Now, it's not just us that think this way. The FDA agrees with us, and the FDA has actually created an entire division called the Botanical Division, which is our, let's say, uh, escort service through the FDA process. And it makes our life easier. It's people that understand exactly what we're trying to do and are actually trying to facilitate the process for us. 
Um, the FDA also gives us certain advantages in that we are much, uh, we have an accelerated track towards clinical trials. So we're able to cut down our costs in terms of drug development and get solutions more rapidly. And they give us what's called a reduced profile of toxicity testing because we know so much about this product when it's being used on a cultural level. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it gives us, there are a lot of advantages to botanicals and there are a lot of challenges. The challenges are number one, um, patents, and number two, uh, control. Well, clearly we've had um, over 100 patents, actually we have about 120 patents, and most of those are granted already. So we have a very, very high percentage of granted patents to, to filed patents. And the reason is that we, we do unique things in how we pull these compounds out and how we understand which molecules are effective. But, um, the, um, the other aspect that's, that's uh, critical here for the, in the botanical world is also trying to balance the, a, a complex of, of drugs. So we, we have developed and we've actually coordinated this with the FDA in a sense is we look at things both from what chemical, in, uh, what chemical products are actually there as well as functionality analysis of so this online botanical testing or rather online biological testing of the material itself so that we know not only what's in it, we know that it still remains active and we've developed that control system and it's actually a very novel approach to the problem and it enables us to control natural materials as you would control a chemical synthetic process. And, and, and how do you overcome the challenges that um, we're seeing here? I mean, I don't know if you've addressed that one. And in addition to the treatment for uh, OM, which is... Oral mucositis, yeah, that's good. I like it. We'll it, stay with OM. <laughs> that, let's stay with that. Are there any other products under development? Yeah, so we actually have a very exciting pipeline. Um, we are, our, our next lead product, which is already a completed early stage of clinical trials, is something called um, VVA, or vulval vaginal atrophy. Um, Breast cancer, as you know, is a terrible uh, you know, disease. And it, unfortunately, its prevalence is growing. And it's actually the, uh, I think, one of the most frequent cancers that exists. But it's definitely by far the most frequent cancer in women today. Now, the problem with breast cancer is that 85% of the breast cancer cells are what's called hormone receptor positive or estrogen receptor positive. So that the level of estrogen in the body, if it's too high or even if it's normal, will actually A, stimulate the tumor to grow, and B, prevent the therapy from having an effect, and C, increase the possibility of recurrence if you get a positive effect. So those problems are critical because you're not going to basically break the breast through the breast cancer uh, problem unless you can solve that. Now, the problem is so the, what the drug industry you know, basically designed was, well, let's get rid of the estrogen. So they designed special drugs to drive down the estrogen levels in these women. And that's exactly the type of thing that we try to avoid because what ended up happening was the vaginal and vulval tissue become terribly dry, very desic, uh, desiccated and friable, meaning it's very fragile. And so the women end up with a lot of pain, dryness, increased infections, and not unimportantly, in fact, maybe primary, uh, very painful sex, which the medical world, like oral mucositis, calls dyspareunia, okay? <laughs> but we'll stick with painful sex. So what, um, now, a woman who's trying desperately to stay alive and has that kind of interference in her spousal relationships is a real major life-impacting problem, and that's the kind of thing that Izun tries to answer. Now, you have to develop a drug here which doesn't impact or have any connection to estrogen or any of the estrogen biologic pathways, which we've successfully done. So we have a drug candidate that's finished phase 2A, which showed very, very effective results. We are now, that, the stage of that product is it's going into phase 2. And another major cancer side effect is nausea, which there are some drugs out there that treat this, although we've developed something which we believe will have a broader range of effect. Um, it's actually already an approved drug that we've modified and made even stronger. It's, um, and the origin of that is actually from the cannabis plant. It's a cannabinoid molecule, 
which we actually make synthetically, but we, we use it effectively by binding it to a special protein syn synthesis process, which makes it much easier to take. We can microdose this product and it gives you a, a stronger therapeutic effect that's more controllable without the side effects. And so uh, that's our third candidate that's in, uh, in progress. And um, we are, uh, you know, planning to, you know, stage by stage, move them forward. But our, our lead remains the oral mucositis. I see we have some questions, but uh, I will address them momentarily. Um, what is the current status and future plans? I, I didn't hear the second part. What? Current st status and future plans. So I, I think I'm going to switch over. Shmuel, do you want to address uh, those questions? Um, yeah, current status and, and future plans. So current status, as uh, Billy mentioned, we've um, we've kind of uh, gone through the tedious process of back and forth with the FDA. And as, as Billy mentioned, we're waiting upon a response, which should come very within next two, three weeks. And um, assuming our optimistic assumptions uh, that are based on, on, on knowledge and facts that we will get a nod to go ahead. We plan to go ahead with the phase three regarding financing. So we're kind of an, at an interesting crossroad in the sense that we are rounding up around B that started a little bit a while ago, but kind of went a little bit uh, derailed because of the COVID and now we're back on track. It was, a, it was set off for a $12 million a raise. We raised about $9 million, so there's about $3 million remaining. And we're actually offering uh, our investors in the round B a 20% discount on the round C that will come imminently, given that we will need to raise more money going into a phase three, which of course is more expensive. So I think from that perspective, there's kind of a, a value proposition here. For, for investors coming in at a round B and, and being able to participate in a round C, which of course will be uh, with a higher valuation as well and uh, with a 20% discount. So kind of earning from all worlds. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, Danny, just maybe add one, one, uh, one other uh, um, element here and that's kind of trying to um, Put us in space where we are compared to what so what can you expect from a company developing such a product uh, for om and as, as billy mentioned there are no approved products so it, it's kind of uh, difficult to understand what is the value of such a company and, and where it can go and and I, i'd like to you know draw your attention to a company called galera which is traded on the nasdaq i think the ticker is grtx I hope I'm, I'm not mistaken from memory right now. And that's an interesting company because they have, they're kind of similar to us or in the sense that they have their leading product is for OM. I'm not going to go into the differences. I think that in, in, in many perspectives, uh, given both products are approved, we have a better advantage because of the route of, route of administration, et cetera. But nevertheless, it's a company that IPO'd uh, late 19 and has been trading since then uh, in the area of 280, $300 million uh, market cap. So um, if we look at Izun right now with, uh, with a valuation of about 30, 30 something million dollars, there's almost a 10X here uh, potential looking at um, another company that is doing more or less the same and is in the public market. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the questions I've left, and by the time I learned to master the word mucositis, there's no question that, that, that has mucositis in it. So just so you know, I, I did manage to, uh, to pull it uh, uh, through. So anyway, Izul is certainly, and, and I'm seeing more questions coming and we'll address them very shortly. Uh, Izun, uh, I just want to finish two more questions here. Izun is certainly an exciting company and really breaking new grounds. Um, in its unique approach to developing better and safer uh, uh, drugs. For investors, what is the value proposition? You talked about it uh, a little bit. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll, I, think, I think I just mentioned what the value proposition, I kind of um, wasn't aware that that was the next question. But um, yes, I think the value proposition here is, as I mentioned, we're talking about a company with a phase three asset 
that is its current valuation given um, you know a compare a, a, a comp of a, li a publicly listed traded uh, company of about 10x less. So I think that's that's the value proposition. And as I mentioned, maybe repeat myself a little bit is that we are offering since we're we're rounding up the round B. Um, and any participant in the round B will have the opportunity to participate in the round C at a 20% discount. I think that's combined with the potential, the potential here is, uh, is a significant value proposition. What's the inv minimum investment size? I don't know if you mentioned that. Yeah, well, yeah, actually a good question. We're looking at a minimum of 50K. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by the way, I didn't ask that before. So far, who is... Who are the investors in the company? It was mainly families, uh, private investors. Yes, actually, over the years, um, we've had a group of loyal, uh, quite a large group of loyal shareholders that consist of high net wealth individuals, family offices, um, I think similar to the audience that we're talking to today. And, and again, maybe you've mentioned it, but how long, uh, uh, when was the company founded? Company was founded in 2001, uh, but our focus initially was completely oral care. So when that product was finished, we actually, around 2010, we then um, moved into uh, oncology support. Thank you. So I will address uh, some of the questions that I, I see here. Um, what would be the size of the relevant market? So the, re the market is, is currently estimated at about... $500 million annually, specifically for oral mucositis. Now, for only PA, yeah. we, we, we need to remember that it's only an estimation. There is no market right now, meaning there is no approved drug, so there's nothing to really learn from. But given the, the, the size uh, of the patient, the patient size and the market that's, you know, it's uh, estimated as somewhere between 500 to $1 billion a year. What would be the cash run rate after the capital raise round? You're, you're, you're alluding to a burn rate? I believe so. Okay, so I, I, I'm, let's, let's try to maybe uh, look at it from, from, a, from a more broader perspective. How much would it cost to take such a product until the goal line? And um, if we, uh, you know, imagine we started tomorrow morning and we wanted to get up until marketing approval, we estimate the cost between 25 to $30 million going through uh, the entire process. And we all remember that drug development is expensive. However, I think $30 million for a phase three is actually on the low side of costs of um, you know, other uh, phase three studies for other indications. Um... Which, okay, now there's, there's an interesting question here that's basically four questions. Um, so part one is asking, what is the MOA of IZN 6 and 4? Um, uh, can we have some colors on the innovation used for this drug, um, like delivery mechanism? They're also asking how many uh, patents are involved in this drug? What are the expiration dates? Uh, can we have, and again, if something is too uh, technical and you want to address it privately, we can do it also uh, that way later on. Can we have more details on the phase two data for SOM, notably the statistical significance and FDA comments, if any? And can you share with us your views on the current state of research for the treatment of oral mucositis? Thank you. <laughs> Well, I can I can only say I, I don't remember all the questions. <laughs> no, no, I, I even in the, in the question um, tab, by the way, if you open. What I what I what I suggest is that we we address some of the questions, and um, although it says an anonymous attendee, but then there's a name here, so um, uh, there, you are welcome to approach us afterwards, and I'm sure that Denny will circulate contact info, and you can ask. But maybe I'll share. I'll share a screen for a minute and just show one or two slides just to give, a, we were requested to give color. So maybe we'll put a little bit of color on the screen. Um, I'm gonna- Shmulek, we, we do have the name. It's Hai Hang. That, okay. Uh, if you see it, the bottom. Hai, so Hai, Hai Hang. Um, let me just share screen. 
Can you see the screen right now? Yeah. Okay, and do you see it in full screen or in presenter mode, just to make sure that we're not... I see what? Uh, I see the, the presentation mode, it's perfect. Okay. So, so this is, this, this is um, we won't go into the entire biology here, but basically what we're seeing here is the pathophysiology of this disease of oral mucositis, which is a multifaceted local submucosal inflammatory disease. And if you go from left to right, you can see normal tissue and then what's happening. And basically uh, it's, it's a, a flare of severe inflammation at the submucosal level that is derived by uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, of course, and reactive species such as, uh, uh, as nitric, nitric oxide and oxygen, etc. So this is basically the underlying cause of disease. Now, uh, if we go one step ahead from the question that we were asked for, and that is, so what is the mode of action? The mode of action is actually the actually tackling this multifaceted inflammatory disease from a, a, a few points of contact, which you'll see on the next slide, which is in vitro pharmacology, ba basically. And that's where the development actually started. So if we look at the inhibition of nitro nitric oxide release, which is a reactive species, which is one of the underlying causes. If we look at the inhibition of TNF alpha, which is a prominent pro-inflammatory cytokine, or if we look at the, uh, the inhibition of NF-kappa-B, which is a transcription factor, which is basically one of the major um, factors responsible for advocating inf inflammation, you can see actually a dose response. So it's not only that we inhibit, but there's a dose response. You give more product, you inhibit more or less, you inhibit less, indicating from a pharmacology point of view, a direct interaction with, with the causes, the underlying causes of inflammation. So this is basically in vitro pharmacology, maybe one more slide or two more slides, just to um, uh, convince that this uh, phenomena that we're seeing in the lab in vitro actually is translated in vivo in animals and then humans. So the next slide is actually an animal model of, of, uh, of the golden standard model of uh, hamsters where the cheek is taken out and um, uh, it, it's giving chemotherapy and it's radiated. It develops a disease very similar to the human disease. And you can see on the left, the differences of the development of the severe oral mucositis between animals that were not treated and animals that were treated with a significant difference. And I'll fast forward now to the phase two study you can see here, and you can, while I'm talking, you can read on the right, one of uh, uh, Professor Sonis, who is the leading key opinion leader in the world right now for this disease. You can see on the left, what happens in patients that are received the placebo versus patients that received our treatment with a 30% relative decrease in the incidence of oral mucositis. And if you're thinking to yourself, is this, important is 37% a lot, a little, amazing, then you can read what uh, uh, Professor Sonis has written on the right. But if we talked before about Galera, just to put things in perspective, a $300 market, market cap company, their relative decrease was about 34%. Um, so um, these, this is a major accomplishment of getting to a 36%. Um, that's, um, I hope that we answered the questions. If there are any more questions, we'll be happy to answer them in more detail on a personal level. Um, which markets are you aiming? How would you describe your target audience? So of course, we're, we're aiming worldwide, but um, given that we're discussing um, mainly with the FDA right now, so of course, um, the first market will be the U.S., um, how many people, by the way, yeah, uh, I, I understand that, the, uh, that the FDA is tougher than the regulation in uh, Europe. Uh, is that so or not really? I, I, I'm not sure that I concur with that conclusion. There's, there's semantics maybe, but I think they're, 
there's about four regulatory agencies that are more or less equal in, in their uh, stringency, like FDA, EMA, the Japanese, the Australian, Canadian. I mean, they're, they're all more or less similar. The FDA is a leader, an innovative leader in regulatory um, perspective. So many look up to the FDA, but I wouldn't say that they're the toughest. I, I, uh, the company that mentioned that was, were doing a new kind of uh, solution. So, uh, so maybe they, uh, they meant when it's a new, completely new area that they don't know it's tougher maybe there than other places. Um, uh, how many people now and add how many more after series B and C? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. How many people now and add, how many investors are involved? I, I'm not sure I understand um, the question actually, unless you've understood. Um, I don't know if the question is about money and not people. So as I mentioned, it's a $12 million employees. rate. They're saying employees, sorry. Okay, employees, employees were, uh, were, yeah, we're about, I don't know, somewhere around 20 employees. Uh -huh. And you, and you uh, do you think you, you hire more people or this is the team you need? Not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's a core team and, and going into clinical trials, there's a lot of outsourcing with CROs and CMOs, and we're basically um, managing and controlling all processes with uh, subject matter experts from in-house that control every aspect of the drug development and drug production and, and clinical trial, et cetera. Thank you. Now, any yeah, anything else? Uh, uh, wait a minute, let me see, I wanna make sure, yeah. Anything else you would like to add uh, Shmulik, uh, Billy, to what we've, uh, to, uh, to your fascinating story. Well, I think you, we, you covered a lot with the questions, Danny, and I personally don't have anything to add. Shmulik, do you? No, well, I really, really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks yeah. for inviting us. Sure, so thank you very much. Uh, as, as always, I will, I will uh, let everybody know that we will send the recording uh, later on so you'd be able to see what, uh, what went on and, and, and look at the information once again. And, and we will send the contact information of Izun so you can um, contact them directly. Um, we are, uh, I will just mention to our audience that next week we have, uh, again, two sessions. Uh, on February 23rd, which is uh, next Tuesday, uh, we will talk uh, um, uh, on the financial markets on, um, on a private credit. Uh, uh, we will be joined by AGF Investments, I believe from Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. And on the 25th, um, we will talk about artificial intelligence and data technologies. Uh, uh, um, very interesting discussion with, um, uh, um, uh, I believe, an American uh, interesting company called um, uh, Pilot Wave Holdings. The guy that basically is behind it was uh, uh, one of the top names in AI, I believe in JP Morgan before, uh, but very, uh, very unique entrepreneur. And when it comes to what we are up to, uh, April 22nd is our in-person conference at the rooftop of the World Trade Center. Um, uh, Larry Silverstein, one of the most impressive names, I believe, in the United States and perhaps worldwide uh, in the real estate world, uh, will be keynoting. And um, in mid-June, we'll be doing our conference at the UAE under the patronage of the Ministry of Economy and with amazing partners like the Expert Institute and the Israeli Tech Association and many, many others, um, in Siad and others. So um, again, I would like to... Uh, Thank uh, 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 um, Dr. William Levine, uh, doc Dr. Shmulik has. It's a doctor as well. You, we didn't put the doctor. Um, you're, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, you worked hard for that. So thank you both for joining us. Enjoy the snow in Jerusalem. Um, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you soon and in person. That was thank like you. a pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, Danny. Bye-bye.